I'm so happy that both of us are here today talking about it um, as, you know, a man, a man and a woman, you know, having a conversation around this. I think uh, conversations are so important. And even if you don't get everything right, it's really important to just have conversation and just open lines of communication. Kind of like in short, I like to call it a biohacking guide for women. Follow a circadian rhythm, but women also follow an infradian rhythm. So because our hormones are fluctuating throughout the month, um, we have different energy levels throughout the month and there can be, um, you know, choices that you can make that are more strategically aligned to capitalize on the strengths of each phase that you experience. Because I, embarrassingly enough, I didn't even realize and really know that well. Like I had heard of the four phases before, but I truly did not understand what they were. Um, so I started researching about that a little bit. And then I came across this um, book called In the Flow by Alyssa Vitti. In the book In the Flow, she talks about caffeine and how caffeine is kind of like the flow blocker. Hello and welcome back. Today's episode is on period syncing and I have an amazing guest on. I originally got sent her page by my partner. She knows the kind of research I was doing at university for my bachelor's, which was on female athletes' perception of strength and conditioning coaches. And one of the things that I found out was that male coaches especially tend to not really speak about the periods and how to approach female athletes and their periods and how to coach effectively for it. So I've been doing a lot of research on it. And so my partner sent me this page and my guest today is really clued up on it she knows what she's talking about and when I was having a look through her page it was just very easy to, to follow for me as a guy so hello Anne how are you doing hi thanks so much for having me Manny good no it's all good you. but the pleasure is mine <laughs> um <laughs> so if you could just tell us some information about yourself how you got started what your journey being like um and just anything that you can really talk about yeah, no, uh, happy to be here and super excited. Um, so uh, kind of a little bit about my background. Um, I've always been passionate about health and fitness. Um, I played sports from a very young age. And actually, I was kind of cracking up the other day. I was thinking about it when I look back at school and playing sports from when I was younger. My favorite class in school was always gym class, um, which is kind of funny to think about. And then um, kind of years later, once I got into high school and sports started to get a little bit more serious for me, um, that's when I started working out in the gym and starting to kind of dive into that strength and conditioning area um, to get in shape for the sports that I was playing. So um, that was kind of my first taste in fitness and my first taste in the gym and then um, once I went off to college, I ended up majoring and studying kinesiology at Penn State. Um, absolutely loved my major and became completely obsessed uh, with the gym. Um, just super passionate and always loved it. And then um, I actually fell into my senior year. I worked as um, a strength and conditioning intern on Penn State football's uh, team. So um, that was where I learned so much just about health and fitness and you know the gym in general and then um, once I graduated I really just continued to hone my fitness skills and continue to learn a lot so um, my background has always been just about health and fitness and super passionate about that area and then um, about a year ago I came across the cycle thinking method and really just fell in love with it um, so that's kind of what I've been focusing on the last year with my fitness and I just absolutely love this method and super excited to, to talk to you about it <laughs> yeah no um again you know i've sent you my paper and stuff like that so there's still a lot that i need to learn as well and obviously because i don't have one for me it's very valuable to speak to people like yourself who are willing to to let me into this very private topic of people's lives and it's still very taboo and I kind of want to talk about it and just make it more of an open conversation with everyone. One of my participants in the study, she was actually, one of the biggest things that she said was like, I kind of want people not to be scared to say period. And mm -hmm. like, because people approach like, oh, menstrual cycles or like very scientific, it's, it's a period, like people just have right. them, or there's different phases there's fluctuations but it's just it's just what it is it's a normal human occurrence right. um so 
for me and I think everyone listening, I think maybe if we got to understand what period thinking was um, and what it actually means and why it's a thing and th- that people should take aboard. Um, so if you can give us a little background on it and how you came across it. Yeah, so um, so basically high level with cycle thinking, it, it involves aligning uh, nutrition, fitness routines, and your lifestyle choices around your monthly hormonal cycle. So um, when we think about, most people are probably familiar with a circadian rhythm, which is like that 24 hour clock that kind of goes with, you know, the sunrise and sunset and kind of how our body functions. So um, all of us follow a circadian rhythm, but women also follow an infradian rhythm. So because our hormones are fluctuating throughout the month, um, we have different energy levels throughout the month and there can be, um, you know, choices that you can make that are more strategically aligned to capitalize on the strengths of each phase that you experience. So kind of like in short, I like to call it a biohacking guide for women. And then how, how I came across it, it's kind of funny, um, similar to, to you. It, it came up in my social media feed one day. I heard somebody talking about cycle thinking and I remember thinking, what is that? I had never heard of it before. So once I came across it, I started researching it online because I, embarrassingly enough, I didn't even realize and really know that well. Like I had heard of the four phases before, but I truly did not understand what they were. Um, so I started researching about that a little bit, and then I came across this um, book called In the Flow by Alyssa Vitti, and she is, and uh, this book, I say, is the health class that I never had in school. I learned so much from this book in such a short amount of time, and it just taught me so much about my cycle and just periods in general, so um, that was a really great resource for me that I started with, and then once I read that book, I felt like it was really life-changing and insightful to read that. And then I started incorporating um, some of the things in my day-to-day through fitness routines and nutrition and just overall productivity um, after I read that book. So, yeah, I kind of just happened to stumble across it, but I feel like it's still pretty new and people are still just finding out about it, but it's really been life-changing for me so far. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the, obviously you mentioned the circadian rhythm, what kind of fluctuations that you'd expect it to see as a woman during your phase? Yeah. So uh, the other way that I like to think about this method and the cycle that women experience, it, it ha- you have your four phases. So it's follicular is the first, um, second is the ovulatory, third is the luteal, and then fourth is the menstrual. So it's broken out into four phases. But The easiest way that I like to think about it and that I learned it was um, thinking about them like the seasons, the four seasons throughout the year. Um, So follicular is your inner spring, uh, ovulatory would be your inner summer, luteal would be your inner fall, and menstrual would be your inner winter. And basically, you know, throughout these these seasons, uh, it kind of aligns with our hormones, um, like during the follicular, follicular phase, which is our inner spring. Um, we're kind of just coming out of our period. Uh, our body's kind of more in a quiet phase and slowly starting to wake up. So that's when we kind of start to, to ramp up training and, and certain things because we're, our energy levels are starting to rise. And then, uh, moving along to the ovulatory phase, that's our inner summer. So during that, that's kind of our peak energy. And this is when we have the most energy and hormones are really surging at this time. Um, and then moving along to the luteal phase, which is the inner fall. This is when our hormones have peaked and they're starting to come down a little bit. So we probably want to slow it down a little bit. Our energy levels are starting to come down. And this is why most women feel really, really tired right before their period because we're kind of, you know, on the decline. And then uh, the fourth phase, the menstrual phase, um, we like to think of it as our inner winter. And that is really just when energy levels are probably at the lowest and uh, is the best time to prioritize rest. So that's the easiest way that I've thought about it. And I feel like it just clicked for me when I started learning this method. I was like, oh, you know, spring, summer, winter, fall makes total sense. Obviously, we follow each other. So I've been keeping up with your Mm -hmm. different seasons. And I think (laughs) that's one of the best ways to put it because show this up. So you've got a lot of resources as well on sort of like age ovulation, Um, yeah each phase sorry and just how you plan for it and I think it's really important that 
women in general just track where they're at and how their hormones feel and just sort of like there's a lot of physical symptoms as well so I think mm-hmm. keeping track of that and just knowing where you are I think it can lead to a better healthier way of programming or um, just going to the gym because I know a lot of stuff that I've read and researched into female athlete like just the female athlete is a lot more likely to burn out than men and that's mm-hmm. because like you are expected to push as hard as men when you've got like different fluctuations that happened I think I read this I it's a, I either read it or heard it somewhere but someone explained to like men wake up and we're back to zero every single day so we can go from there mm-hmm. where women you you can be wake up one day at zero mm-hmm. go to bed at 50 wake up at mm-hmm. 95 <laughs> And then you're having to yeah. do and push through the same. So I think keeping track and knowing exactly where you are can sort of limit those experiences of like fatigue and burnout just by knowing where you are. Okay, I'm yeah. in my ovulation phase. I need to dial it down this week because I'm more likely to not be able to push as much. Not, like So the way that I've researched and been told is like the two weeks beforehand you're the strongest that you could probably ever be. Then Mm -hmm. on your sort of luteal and ovulation phase, it's better to do longer distances or longer runs than push as heavy because you're not going to have the same energy levels. So I'm kind of interested in you speaking about like your experience through the gym and just how you felt these different peaks and fluctuations. Yeah, once and I've been doing this method for over a year at this point. So I feel like I have like a pretty good uh, grasp on how I feel um, month to month. And it's crazy when I think about when I'm in my ovulatory phase and my energy is peaking, I feel like I go to the gym and I just flow right through my workout. feel so good. Um, Obviously you you feel tired at the end, but um, I just feel like I have so much energy. And even especially when I'm weightlifting, I feel like I can just lift so much heavier where you know, uh, the luteal phase when I'm starting to slow it down. If I go to the gym, I feel like 15 pound weights feel like 50 pound weights. Like just the difference that you notice in, in, um, like strength and, and just overall energy levels is kind of crazy to me. And I think about probably years ago, all the times that I used to push myself during those phases and then wondering why I felt so weak during those weeks. It's kind of crazy to think about and it really just put the pieces together for me. Um, and that kind of to your point or earlier, uh, talking about men versus women. And it's funny because men kind of experience these phases almost in one day. Like you get, it's the circadian rhythm, the 24 hour clock. So it's like you wake up, uh, you're energized, you do work, you come home, you're tired and you fall asleep. It's like you have those four phases in 24 hours. But for us, it's, you know, fluctuating all throughout the month. So like you said, some days we wake up and we feel really great. Some days we wake up and we don't want to get out of bed. Um, it's just kind of getting into a rhythm and noticing uh, those differences and, and how you feel throughout the month and, and really not pushing yourself when you shouldn't be and really prioritizing rest when you should be. So so what are some strategies that you implement on your sort of day-to-day or week-to-week, month-to-month to sort of make sure that you're not reaching that burnout stage or 100% stages? Yeah, so the the big thing for me, um, which you showed earlier and what you came across on TikTok, has been setting up my workout plan a month ahead of time. And this just really guides me for the month and really gives me a good heads up each week what I should be focusing on. So, you know, each week when I start my workouts for the week, I'm like, okay, this is my moderate intensity phase. Okay, this is my high intensity phase. And it really just provides a big picture for that month ahead of like what I should be focusing on. Um, So that is, that has been a game changer for me. And really just thinking about my month, big picture um, has made a huge, huge difference. So that's probably been the most helpful. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm pulling this up because I think it's a really good resource to have. Obviously everyone's individual and not every period is the same. I think Mm -hmm. having a really good, basis on what to start will help a lot of people do you want to talk through 
sort of this plan and how you came across creating it? Yeah, so um, basically how I have this broken out is I, I have this broken out into the four seasons. So um, that's top line follicular, that's our inner spring. Second line's the ovulatory, our inner summer. Luteal would be our inner fall, and then menstrual would be our inner winter. Um, and there, there's a range between each phase, but big picture, I like to lay it out on a weekly basis. And basically, um, the intensity levels kind of change from week to week. So for this first week at the top, the follicular, um, that's when I kind of do my moderate intensity exercises. And um, I strength train three times a week for most of the month. And so that's kind of why I have my Monday, Wednesday, Friday is my lifting days. Uh, Mondays, I'll lift lower body. Wednesdays, I'll lift upper body. And Fridays, I'll do a full body lift. But then in between those lifting days, I kind of match the cardio for the week to match with the intensity level for that week. So follicular, um, our energy is on the rise and we're starting to get more energy. So, you know, I, I have, this is calendar is basically just an example of what I do, but you could really substitute any workout that you enjoy. But in between my lifting days, I could do like a Peloton pop class or um, a power yoga class. And then um, that would be the first week. And then second week, ovulatory. This is when we're kind of at like peak energy, peak strength. Um, so that's kind of the best time to do a HIIT class or anything that gets your heart rate super high is the best workout to complete this week. So um, that's kind of when you see me ramping up my cardio uh, in between the lifting days. And then luteal phase comes after that. That's the third line. Um, that's when I start to slow it down a bit. So you'll see instead of doing like a Peloton HIIT class or a power yoga class, this is when I really just start to walk and do really low intensity, low impact. Uh, training in between my lifting days. So um, I'll sprinkle in like an incline walk or a walk outside. Uh, yin yoga class is really good to do around this time. And then during the menstrual phase, you'll see that is like I joke around, I call it my inner slug phase. Um, I really just rest and walk and stretch. Um, that is what I found has been the best for me that week. And um, a lot of people have asked questions about like, I don't know, don't you hate taking a week off or don't you feel like you're um, losing progress or you're getting behind and I haven't lost progress I honestly feel like it's like my recovery week and I come back stronger because I've taken the time to recover and rest so um, I've actually really started to look forward to that week so yeah I think that's also a, a big thing to to get across is peak performance could only happen if you rest and you're well equipped for what's to come I read uh, a book called Peak Performance um, not long ago, and it actually has their athletes the week before like a big competition or a big sort of event, sort of take a couple of weeks off beforehand, come back the week before, ramp not ramp up the training, but like do some mm -hmm. just normal training. And then when they're in competition, they feel like energized, they feel so much better because they've had time and allow their body to rest and stuff like that so i really like that and that's that plan and that's why i kind of wanted you to talk through it because i think it's really important to again keep track of everything and just make sure that you're doing everything that you can to perform at your best with that i do know that you place a lot of importance on your nutrition and your rest and sleep can you give us some of the strategies that you implement in yourself during each phase yeah, so nutrition is also a big one. Um, I feel like the, the biggest thing high level that I learned about nutrition is uh, your metabolism works differently through the different phases. So um, to believe it or not, your metabolism is actually slower through the first half of your cycle. Um, so you'll feel better with lighter foods and probably not as many calories, which I never knew. But then once I started realizing that and um, thinking about it and uh, tracking my nutrition, I realized how in the beginning of the my cycle, I just don't have as much of an appetite and I'm just not as hungry. And then towards the end of the cycle, uh, once you hit your luteal phase and you're preparing uh, for to get your period, you need way more calories and way more nutrient dense calories. And I've just noticed just the difference in my appetite levels throughout the month. Uh, like I said, in the beginning of the month, I'm less hungry. Towards the end of the month, I'm way more hungry right before my period. And just kind of eating in 
uh, flux with how your cycle is going. So um, in the beginning of my cycle, I usually like to stick with lighter foods. So um, lots of, you know, salads and veggies and especially during the ovulatory phase, um, that's when kind of like raw foods are the best. So any kind of like juices, smoothies, um, anything like that, it, you'll just do better with a little bit lighter meals. And then uh, towards the end of your cycle, I definitely have noticed myself get way more hungry and I just need those like nutrient dense foods. So I'll need, you know, like sweet potatoes, brown rice. Like I, I, I start to eat like grain bowls and, and stuff like that. That'll keep me full for a way longer time. Um, cause your body just needs more calories when you're getting ready for your period. Um, and it's similar to like the, the fall season, um, that's kind of the best time to roast vegetables in the oven and really like roasting and baking is kind of like the best, uh, preparation style for that phase. And then, um, inner winter is obviously the, the period, period phase. And, uh, that's my favorite time to make, you know, soups or stews or like anything that's super warming, Comfort um, foods. Yep. Any any kind of a comfort food, that's like the my favorite time to eat anything like that. So Yeah. No, um I did also want to ask you about um so th- wh- one of your videos I kinda paused that certain area because I wasn't quite sure what you were meaning and I saw that you had no coffee this week or this day oh, yeah. or something. <laughs> Can you explain that a little bit as well? Because I obviously I'm a coffee uh, addict. Yep. Um, so it, for people that might not know the kind of impacts of what coffee has on the body and what happens physiologically with it, so if you just want to explain that a little bit. Also, I do want to say first, I got my phases wrong um, I, when I was talking about uh, the ovulation phase, I was actually meaning the menstrual phase, um, so okay. it was just a little mistake that I picked up when I was looking through your uh, calendar so oh, okay. I would just just to make that clear because I yeah um so yeah coffee <laughs> and the impact it has yeah and this actually it felt like it was such a minor change that I made um but I had read actually in the book in the flow she talks about caffeine and how caffeine's kind of like the flow blocker um she actually recommends in the book to most women should probably cut caffeine out 100 percent because it really does affect your hormones and stuff but i don't think that's realistic because i absolutely love coffee um but i could never see myself giving it up fully but if i have to give it up a few days out of the month to make myself feel better i'm all for that so um once i read that i started kind of doing a little bit of experimenting and I realized if I cut out any kind of caffeine or coffee b- about two to three days before my period and for the first at least two days of my period, I just feel way better. I have basically zero cramps when I have my period, which is crazy because usually um, it kind of ebbs and flows before I started doing this. Some months I would have you know normal cramps and some months I would have really debilitating cramps. So. Um, once I started doing the caffeine thing, I just noticed my cramps went away fully when I got my period, which is crazy because you feel so much better when you don't have those. So, um, the caffeine, you know, just cutting it out a few days before you get your period, caffeine is very dehydrating. So, um, if we're drinking it, you know, a few days before our period, when our body's prepping to get that period, it's kind of depleting us of all these key nutrients and hydration that we need to kind of weather the storm through that phase. So I've just realized uh, cutting out the caffeine and really increasing my water intake um, has really just completely changed yeah. how I feel during my period. So Yeah, no, um, I've been reading a lot about coffee recently. And so I used to say to myself, like anytime before 4 p.m., I'd be able to have a coffee and I'd be fine for nighttime. But then it would get to nighttime mm-hmm. and I just couldn't sleep. And yep. then I cut it down to 2 p.m. because it stays in your system for like 6 to 12 hours. So I tried it then and I'm just like, I, I got to bed and I was like, still not. So I've cut it back to 10, uh, 10 a.m. And I think that's now the sweet spot. So anytime before, mm-hmm. I'm, I just can't, I, I have as much coffee as I can during that time. Anything after, I'm just like, no more. So yeah for me not being able to sleep and obviously i don't have the 
fluctuations i i can only imagine what it must be like to just sort of be all unbalanced and just go coffee be up here all the time and then just see what i do want to ask some of the differences that you've obviously felt while you're going on this journey like in the gym and if you found any differences in sport or anything like that yeah um I get asked a lot of questions about kind of what are the benefits of this and like, why should I start it? And the biggest one for me has just, like I said, energy levels. I feel like overall my energy levels throughout the month have just been way more improved um, probably because I'm resting when I need to rest and, you know, working when I need to work. And I think to your point earlier, I'm not as burnt out as I was before because I'm kind of in the flow all month with my energy. So the biggest one for me has been just like energy levels have been way better. Um, my second one that I absolutely love about this method is the variation it provides me throughout the month. Um, I feel like in the past, if I did the same workout all the time, I used to get super bored. I love changing it up. So I love week to week, you know, having a totally different intensity level and just like variation throughout the month because it, it definitely keeps me interested. Um, and I think like, that's a really big thing about like fitness progress is just being consistent over time. So I think that's the really nice part about this method is just being able to be super, super consistent month to month. And then I also just feel more productive in uh, the book. She also talks about kind of productivity methods and, you know, you might feel more creative during this phase and more task oriented during this phase. So I really tried to kind of big picture incorporate that into my life. Like some weeks I, I know I'll be super productive. Some weeks I know I'll be kind of a slug and not really want to do anything. So I'll kind of plan my month out around that so I can be super, super efficient. And I would say the biggest thing too is I overall just feel more intuitive with my body and just feel like I'm working with my body instead of against it. Yeah. And I feel like I just ignored so many things for so long because I was never told to pay attention to it. But now that I've really, really listened to my body and started to pay attention to it, I've realized just how much it, it's really telling me. And um, it just, it's just really, uh, it just clicked once yeah. I started listening to it. <laughs> we, we have sort of spoke about this uh, before, but it's that whole school's approach to talking about the period with females and just women in general, like just kind of get isolated from the men the boys sort of do their own thing while the girls and women go and have this chat about their periods and we were talking about um sort of the benefit that it would have for like the generation where the guys actually got to listen to that and how that would develop it mm -hmm. obviously i was on the side that i got to play so what was it like getting pulled aside and just having this conversation at school yeah, it's funny, us messaging back and forth about that and thinking about it. Um, looking back, I just shake my head at how kind of ridiculous that is, that they separated us yeah. out. And um, I, I joke around that I was probably in third or fourth grade or something like that. And I said they, I remember them putting a video and played a video for the class. And I'm pretty sure that video was from like 1950 yeah. that, you know, said like, uh, basically you get a period and use a pad. And I think they gave, I think they handed out pads when we were at school and they were like, oh, this is what you use. But that was basically the gist, like you get a period, but it was nothing like you have four phases. Uh, this is, you know, the time that you get pregnant. This is the time you can get pregnant. Nothing about that. Nothing about energy levels or how you might feel during different phases. It was just very, very basic. And then, um, yeah, I, I do remember the, the boys being in a separate room and it's like, they should be learning about this. Yeah. Like, it's just kind of funny to think back on and, you know, it's hard enough for women to understand and we are the ones that go through it. I think for men to learn this at an earlier age would just make so much sense to yeah. them because, you know, you guys are dealing with us on a daily basis. So. <laughs> um, and before we even hopped on the podcast, we were speaking a little bit about sort of like the education that it is around it for, for women that you deal with it. Like, Again, in my research, I've every woman that I spoke to essentially said that there's not really any resource out there, or if they did know, it was very general, very basic. This is the way that I do it, so that's the way that it works. But obviously, every woman's different, every period's different. So, what are the, some of the things that, with the period sinking, that you found that can be very individualized for sort of women wanting to embark on that? Yeah, I think. Uh, I mean, just the hardest part is 
learning what works for your body and what doesn't. And online on a lot of my videos, a lot of women posted, well, I feel better during this phase and I don't feel so good during this phase. Like everybody just has a totally different experience. And the best part about this method is it's not like a one size fits all. You can really tailor it to yourself and to your body and to your fitness routine. Um, you can tailor it into like what you like doing. Like obviously I have a, my workout calendar and that's kind of just like a guide and to give people ideas. Um, if people hate Peloton or hate yoga, obviously they don't need to be doing those workouts. They can kind of tailor it to themselves. So the one part that's kind of nice about this method is you just need to, to learn generally how it works, but then you really just got to learn what's best for you. But I think that's my favorite part is that, you know, no one's method is going to look the same. Like you can tailor it to yourself and really make it work for you. So Yeah, 100%. And I think it's really important because it's, it's something that happens every month. And I think just keeping mm-hmm. on track and keeping on top of every single sim like it, it is hard to start because like you don't really know what you're looking for or you don't know mm-hmm. what things should feel like what is normal what isn't um and i think it, it's one of those things that by rep- repeating the thing this action you can get a lot better of feeling okay and actually i think i think it's the flow up they have mm-hmm. a lot of um symptom based um record keeping so yeah, and that's th- what I actually I've used that for years just to track my period that app um and I don't it's, it's funny I've used that app for probably you know five or so years at this point and I used it just to track my period um and I never paid attention to anything else because the only thing I ever cared about was like when am I going to get my period like when is it going to be super inconvenient to get it uh <laughs> But now, um, obviously, I pay attention to everything else and all four of the phases. So, um, and and to your point, kind of what you mentioned earlier, I think the biggest challenge for women starting this is number one is just education. Um, obviously, it's you know so much information to learn, and it can be very very overwhelming at the beginning. Um, this is something I wish I learned when I was younger in school, but. You know, when you when you start, you kind of feel like you're at the bottom of this very steep and confusing mountain, and you're kind of <laughs> starting to make uh, your way up the mountain to kind of figure out this method and everything. And um, I would just say the best place for women to start would be, you know, don't try and focus on everything at once, and kind of just, you know, educate yourself first, and then take baby steps into incorporating a few, you know, one thing at a time, and not doing everything at once. I think as well, like following people like you who are willing to share this information is really important. And I do think that that would be an amazing place to start is just listening to, and again, I'm a man and I was able to keep up with everything that you were saying. I have done research on this, so I'm a little bit more clued up on some things, but I think for me, especially like the seasons and how you explained that, I was like, okay, that I, obviously <laughs> I don't know how that feels, but... I can relate to those seasons and I can sort yep. of like get the gist of how you may feel during that. Again, every female's different, but just getting a sense for, okay, coming up to autumn, a bit cold, so I'll warm up, I'll do some things. Mm-hmm. Like again, when you were talking about winter and having soups and having very like comfort food type meals, mm-hmm. for me, I'm like, ah okay so they just okay that makes sense so that clicked (laughs) so i think speaking to people like you or just even following and getting in touch i know you're quite you reply to a lot of people that like i mentioned at the start i messaged you i commented on one of your posts just saying hey i've done some research around this area would you mind having a chat or something like that and then you Mm -hmm. messaged me straight away and i was like oh okay so that made me instantly feel more comfortable talking about it. And obviously we've exchanged a lot of messages and you've got my paper that you've read. Um, mm-hmm. So I think following people like you is really important as well. It's the same with anything really. Like if I follow certain people for what they talk about, like in their strength and conditioning. Right. So, and I've sp- spoke to a lot of strength and conditioning coaches. I know what to go about it, but I think everything would still apply for period thinking. That's- what I was going to say, that's actually one of my favorite parts about, um, I obviously love posting content. I love talking about this subject, but uh, I love connecting with people and I love replying to comments. And when you uh, messaged me about your paper, I was like, oh, I'd love to read your paper. And 
uh, I read it and I really enjoyed it. So, um, yeah, I love talking to people. I love meeting new people. So I'm so happy that we connected. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny how that works. No. Um, and the, the, another thing that came from us sort of speaking and chatting was that you kind of look back at your athletic career and you were like, damn, like this should have been <laughs> spoken to, to me about a lot more about it. So what's some of the experiences that you had during your, I know you're a soccer or football player. What sort of experiences <laughs> sort of did you look back at and you were thinking, oh, well, that may, that should have probably been different. Yeah, it's, it's funny. You say soccer, you say soccer, I guess it would be football in the, in the UK and yeah. Europe. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's funny looking back, especially in high school when I really got serious into to soccer um, every summer right before school started, we had preseason, um, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with if they do play sports. And preseason, it was like two to three weeks before the actual season started. And that was more of like our, our strength and conditioning. We weren't really, you know, practicing and playing games that much. It was more, you know, physical fitness, running, like all that type of stuff. And uh, I remember different dates, like now looking back, different days during I used to have two a days so in the morning we'd wake up at you know 6 a.m and have a uh, strength and conditioning class and then in the afternoon we'd go back and we'd have to run a couple miles and do like ab classes and just just all like you know it was centered around strength and conditioning but it was two a days so we had a session in the morning from like six to eight in the morning and then we'd have the afternoon to kind of like nap and take a break and then we'd have to go back um, in the afternoon around like three o'clock and it would be like a, you know, three to five or three to 6 PM second practice of the day. So we had these double practices for like three weeks leading up to our actual season and they got me in really great shape, but I just remember, and now looking back, there were some days where I felt amazing. I could run for miles and miles. And then some days I felt like I was really, really struggling during some of those practices. So um, it's kind of funny to look back at and be like, wow, I was really pushing myself during weeks where I really shouldn't have. So um, just, you know, just, if I knew this method earlier, yeah. I could have been a little bit more kind of to myself and really realized why I was feeling the way that I was feeling. And uh, maybe even the coaches could have taken it a little bit easier on me during certain uh, phases that I was in. So um, it's I, just interesting to think back on. I think that's a really important thing to talk about is the – amount of mental torture that you get for not feeling 100% during these practices and I think for me speaking to the, 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 the athletes that I've spoken to was that there was obviously some points of the month where they just didn't want to be there, didn't want to do it but then there would be that oh but you're an athlete, like you have to be in here like you have to want it um, mm -hmm. so I think that mental torture between I know where, what I need to do and I can't do it what are some ways that you've found now to get over those um, sort of mental battles with yourself? Yeah, yeah. The biggest thing is really being comfortable and prioritizing the rest that we talked about when you need it um, and just not feeling the pressure to push yourself 24 seven. And now because I understand more how my body works and how I might be feeling throughout the month, I understand that it's almost like this too shall pass. So if you're feeling a certain way one day, just know it, you know, could be totally different the next day. And I think that has worked the best for me, um, really getting used to pri prioritizing rest and really looking forward to that in order to, you know, come back stronger than I was before. And um, interestingly enough, too, thinking back, my sister and I were joking about this the other day. Uh, when you think about like tampon commercials and things like that, uh, growing up, you'd see like a tampon commercial and it'd be like, oh, somebody like playing tennis and running and doing all this like high intensity workouts. And that was like how they were selling tampons. Like, oh, you can do whatever, even though you're on your period. And now it's so funny. I'm like, everything I learned before I have to unlearn now because I'm like, this doesn't even make sense with how my body feels. So like I said, really just prioritizing the rest when you need it. And uh, that's been the, the biggest thing mentally that has really helped me because I think for years I just pushed myself 24-7. Yeah. And then to your point earlier, I was probably burnt out and didn't realize why. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you bring that up, but I kind of want you to dive into a little bit because for me, I've not really spoke to anyone about it. But what's your 
methods of t- like obviously you spoke about tampons and pads like what are some of the things that female athletes or f- um females in general can look into while doing these high intensity classes or sports or just in the gym yeah i feel like you know just learning about this method in general is really going to help when you can schedule those high intensity uh, classes um it really just makes sense on a basic level once you start to get to know your body you know when the best time throughout the month is to schedule those high intensity classes so and once you start to learn about your body and really get to know it you'll just intuitively feel you know when the best time is throughout the month to do those higher intensity classes so um, it's really a lot of trial and error and like I said I've been doing this for almost a year at this point Um, it it definitely didn't happen overnight it's a lot of trial and error and just being patient with yourself and and kind of just taking it you know one week at a time and um, and then kind of looking back at your progress over over several several months. Do you think there's anything else that you can sort of look at when you start this journey? Uh, I think, you know, we talked about earlier, number one, like the most important thing is just education, really just educating yourself about these methods and what they are. Um, I think that's just like such a good foundation when you're starting this method is really um, just the education portion. And then, um, like I said, just a lot of women were like, I don't know where to start or how to start this. It's like, just take it one step at a time and just start somewhere. I think a lot of women what kind of holds them back from trying this is like they don't know their phases perfectly and they kind of want to get everything perfect and it's like it's not about being perfect it's about just starting um it's kind of like progress over perfection so to kind of just start somewhere and figure it out as you go um and also just be really patient with yourself when you are learning um there's so much new info that i learned in such a short amount of time and like I said earlier uh, we really have to unlearn everything that we've ever been taught uh, kind of by society and also things that we never learned in school so it's really just about being patient being kind to yourself and just taking it one step at, at a time yeah um I kind of wanted to ask what is some of the like what is one piece of advice that you could give coaches and trainers to sort of help their athletes and clients through their menstrual cycle or even if they want to look into period syncing what's some advice around that that you would give yeah i think education such a big part you know reading books like in the flow uh to really learn about how women's hormone cycle works i think to your point earlier of it's in the past this has been kind of looked at as taboo and I don't think men want to bring it up because they don't want to say anything wrong. And then sometimes women feel uncomfortable about talking about it. So um, I'm so happy that both of us are here today talking about it um, as, you know, a man, a man and a woman, you know, having a conversation around this. I think uh, conversations are so important. And even if you don't get everything right, it's really important to just have conversation and just open lines of communication. Um, Because I think about, you know, going back to years and years that I played soccer, I think, probably 90% of my coaches were men. Um, And I loved all of my coaches, but I honestly think either they felt uncomfortable about this subject or they just honestly didn't know enough about it to talk about it. Um, So I think really it just goes back to education and also um, somebody just, and it's probably on the coaches to to start this conversation, but um, even if you feel uncomfortable about it, it's really important to just kind of like get it out in the open and just, you know, put it out there that you're aware of this, or you're thinking about it, and kind of just start that, start those open lines of communication. I think it's so important. Yeah, when I was doing my research, actually, um, there was two things that came out: is female athletes don't really care what gender their coaches are. The biggest factor for them is their knowledge and sort of educational background. If they know what they're mm-hmm. talking about and they can get that message across, female don't care if it's a man, a woman coaching them. They just want to be there. And they're very happy to be coached by anyone. The second thing that sort of came out of my research was I sort of developed a way to approach this. So if any coaches out there want sort of a, a little script of what to say, is like, look, I know what happens during the period. Um, I know that mm-hmm. there's different phases there's different uh, hormonal changes that happen 
you can talk to me about it you can't not it's up to you one of the best one of the best things that we can do though is if it starts affecting your training or the way you're feeling towards your training you can come to mm-hmm. me and we can talk about it or if you just want to keep going or just let me know that not today that's fine too right. Because, like, from the female perspective, that kind of puts the ball in your court. So if you want to approach me and talk to me about it, I'm all up for right. it. If you don't, then we don't have to. You just have to say not today. And I sort of know what's happening, so I can just back off a little bit. Obviously, if it's team sports, it's a little bit harder to do that for everyone. Because, obviously, right. there's different periodization points that we need to hit during the season. But for just general athletes we can maybe knock it down by 10 20 pounds or just make it a little bit lighter so that you can still perform and do the movement but you don't have to worry about not hitting your goals for that session and i think that's a really good speech to have even if you're a female because females some may still get nervous talking to other females about it um Mm -hmm. Have you experienced any of that during your coaching or during your educational through Penn State or anything? Uh, uh, have I experienced other women being uncomfortable yeah. talking about this? Um, I, I guess it it depend. It really depends. I think you know some women are more comfortable talking about this than others. I can't think back to like any particular experiences, but I think just in general, there's definitely some women that are super open about talking about this and some women that aren't. And I would guess that a lot of the women that might not be as open, you know, it goes back to maybe what they were taught when they were younger. And then also maybe what they weren't taught because, you know, they might not have a lot of education around this subject still. So um, it really just depends, but um, I think it just depends on the person. Um, but like you said, I think it's really important just to have conversations early on and kind of put it out there. And to your point, you know, if, you don't have to get into like details, but you know, if I think back in the past, if I just told my coach like, Hey, I think I need to take it easy today. And for them understanding why, like that would be just, you know, so helpful. So, um, yeah. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. And like, it goes back to that. Um, openness and comfortableness of talking about it we spoke at the beginning and we were saying that from what i found just being able to say the period word is a big Mm -hmm. thing and people still get uncomfortable when that word's mentioned and um yeah you read my research and there was when i was discussing my findings i said from now on instead of menstrual cycle i will be saying period because that's what Mm -hmm. female won't it to be referred as they want to make that word not a taboo subject so from then on anytime that i would talk about the menstrual cycle i would say period i would go into the different phases that's you can't get around that but it's a period Mm -hmm. and i think just being able to say that and just being comfortable saying that so i kind of want to say just going back to really quickly thinking about when we were younger and separated in school learning about this i remember once I got my period and was older, like in, uh, you know, later grade school and high school, when I had my period in school, if I ever like needed a tampon or anything, I was always hiding it from the guys. Cause I was like, I don't want them to see that I have my period. And it's like, it's so funny looking back. I'm like, why do, why did I care? And you know, if they had learned about this and knew about this more, they wouldn't have cared, but it's just kind of viewed out as taboo from when you're younger and it kind of affects how you act when you're older. Um, so kind of funny to, to look back on. Yeah, and I think that's that's the biggest difference. I think early education, and I mentioned that in my paper, is like the earlier we can educate everyone on it, the mm-hmm. less that women have to hide about it. Because it's like, mm-hmm. it's first of all, it's something very natural. Happens to right. all women. Um, but why should I get uncomfortable of something that happens normally? It's like, if, right. if I... Like, I'll buy pads and stuff for my partner and like I'll I'll be in the shop just buying them. People will look at me, I'm just like Yeah, you're like just normal. A, just an average Tuesday. Like this is fine. Exactly. This is normal. <laughs> um what are some of the challenges that you've sort of faced in learning about this and talking about it so openly? Uh yeah, I think challenges have just been really trying in the beginning to figure out where to start. That was definitely the biggest challenge to overcome. Um, really just like navigating that 
educational hurdle and really figuring this out. So um, now I feel like I have a pretty good base for that. But like I said, that did not come overnight. And I think the biggest challenge of this, like I, I said earlier, just unlearning things that you thought um, in the yeah, past, the way that things are, you really just have to unlearn everything you were ever taught, um, really just figure out what works for you. And again, like this just doesn't happen overnight. It's a lot of, you know, personal, what's, what works for you personally. And it's a lot of trial and error. So I think sometimes definitely through fitness and in some things, people are always looking for that super quick fix. Uh, this definitely isn't that it's, you know, uh, consistent progress from, you know, week to week and month to month. And it really doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. And I think that's an important message to get across. It's like that little, it's that 1% getting better every single day. Mm-hmm. And just realizing, okay, today I'm not feeling my best. Why is that? Where am I? Do you have any tracking sort of tips that you can give people? Uh, tips I would just say, you know, start with one thing at a time. Don't do uh, fitness, nutrition, and the productivity schedule all at once. Uh, the best thing that worked for me was picking one, which the fitness part was the most intuitive for me, just with my background. So I started with that and then slowly started to incorporate food and more of like the product productivity hacks. Um, after I had, I had been doing the fitness schedule for a few months. So, um, I think that's probably like my biggest tip is don't feel like you have to do all of this at once. There's a lot that goes into this and it can feel very overwhelming. So really just going back to those baby steps yeah it's really baby steps and one thing at a time yeah no 100 percent. and it's it's that again better every single day like i i, yeah. I know I, I sound like a, i'm being a dead horse but i think the consistency is the key for that um do you have anyone that like you speak to a lot about this and you just can bounce ideas off it um so i've been talking a lot about this with just my family in general. Uh, It's funny, just both of my parents and um, also, you know, my siblings as well. Um, Obviously, my boyfriend, uh, we live together. So um, he's been learning a ton of information throughout me and throughout this whole journey. Um, So it's really funny when he's been, you know, seeing my videos, seeing me produce content and stuff like that. He's like, wow, who would have thought, you know, I never knew any of this stuff. And Um, we're kind of cracking up. He's learned so much in such a short amount of time just through my experience. And uh, for him, it's really funny to have him understand why I am the way I am throughout the month. Uh, So I think he knows like certain times of the month to approach me with certain things (laughs) and certain times not to approach me with certain things. So um, relationship wise, it's actually just really, really helpful. And I'm sure like you with your partner, um, it, it just makes so much sense. And I think it uh, kind of avoids a lot of communication errors that probably happen in relationships that you don't notice before. But um, yeah, I always bounce a lot of ideas off him, but also just my family in general. And uh, I just love, you know, hearing their perspective. And we just just talk about even like the past, like they were around for years and years when I can, you know, did competitive sports and um, you know, and now when I talk about this with them, they're even like, wow, like this would have been great if you knew this when you were younger. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, my mom didn't, my mom never learned about this stuff either. So, um, it's just really interesting to kind of look back over the past and see kind of, uh, the progression of everything. Yeah. So, so what's it been like having your mom learn about this now? Uh, she is like, why the heck didn't I know this years and years ago because she was like this just would have made so much sense for me and um a lot of the you know period pains and certain things that she dealt with when she was younger she was like I wish I you know know knew about like not drinking caffeine right before and um you know she kind of had a lot of like period pain when she was younger and she's like I definitely could have done things to avoid this but um they weren't really telling you you know in those days they didn't tell you anything about that and she said the same thing when she was in school her like health class was basically non-existent it was basically like here's you know you get a period and that's that so um yeah yeah no and i think again it goes back to the early education and i think even the resources that teachers use kind of need to be updated Um, because like when Obviously, I didn't get the period one, but I got the sex one. 
and it was like mm-hmm. I'm, I'm pretty sure the teacher got a banana like like in the old movies and just told us what to do and how to put a condom on and stuff like that and I'm like alright there's probably better ways of doing this <laughs> I honestly I don't even think I, I know from my experience in the US they didn't even really talk about that stuff they literally I remember in health class when it was just general like sex ed and uh, I guess it was in high school or what, whatever they just basically made us fill out diagrams of like anatomy and I'm like that was like the least helpful thing ever um, they didn't really talk about you know just like the process or anything like that they basically were like here's a a diagram to fill out and just like you know fill out the anatomy of you know men versus women and that was really that so um even just you know educating myself after school of you know what times are women more fertile during the month when aren't they more like you know i never learned that in school and i think because they thought it was too taboo and they didn't want to kind of um they basically just told you not to get pregnant. They didn't tell you how to get pregnant. They didn't tell you there were certain times of the month you couldn't get pregnant. It was just like, oh, yeah, don't get pregnant. So. Yeah. Um, do you think your educational background, so obviously that you were at Penn State doing kinesiology, mm-hmm. do you think that's helped in any? 100%. Um, when I did, I absolutely loved my major at Penn State. Like I said, I was kinesiology, so um a lot of my classes were about like the history of sport and coaching and leadership. And um, then I had anatomy, physiology. Um, I had, you know, kinesiology classes where, you know, during the labs, we'd have like all these leads hooked up to people and they'd be running on treadmills and we'd be like tracking all this different stuff. So um, having that, you know, really formal science background definitely helped me uh, for the education portion of my background. And then actually I mentioned, uh, my senior year, I actually worked with the Penn State football team on the strength and conditioning team. Um, and I was deaf. I remember starting on that team and working with the guys. Obviously, they're like these huge football players. They're all like six, five huge dudes. Um, and the trainers, all the coaches told me they're like, you know, once the guys are out of the gym and we, they would do their strength and conditioning first and then they go out to practice later they were like, oh, all the coaches work out together. So if you're interested, we'd love to, you know, work out with you. We kind of all like, you know, uh, lift at the same time in the gym. And I was a little bit nervous. I was like, oh, that's really nice and very cool. And all of the strength and conditioning coaches were men. And my first day I was like, oh, you know what? I'm I'm just going to try it. And it was the best thing that ever happened, even though I was so nervous to get in the gym with all of these, you know, really experienced, super knowledgeable strength and conditioning coaches when I started uh, lifting and doing different things, you know, they would help me out like, Hey, you should try this. And you know, this is the best form and this is the best technique. So um, through working on that team, I just learned so much through those men and I just absolutely loved being in the gym and just learning from them. And um, I think a lot of people get really intimidated about the gym, but for me, when I'm in the gym and I see somebody that's new, I never think like, Oh, they don't know what they do. They're doing. I always think, Oh, I remember being there and I remember starting there and, um, you know, it's just kind of giving yourself a little bit of confidence to, to just put yourself out there. And the only way you're going to learn is kind of, you know, throwing yourself into the fire and just kind of like figuring it out. So I'm really happy I did that internship yeah. because I feel like I just learned so, so much. <laughs> no. Um, so I've had a similar experience, but I was obviously a male and I was at Washington um, University, but there was this, uh, there was a female coach, Caroline Gagne, and she she's honestly one of my favorite people. She's she did the yoga for the guys as well, but she oh, that's awesome. she's she was a female and she was only female in there. So she, we we so I grew up with a sister, so just from background, and obviously I connect with females a bit better as well because like my sister was always there for me. She she kind of brought me up, so I've always been very comfortable talking about these situations and these topics. So me and her kind of got talking and there was this sort of intimidation level that comes into being the only female in a male dominant environment. Um, Mm -hmm. And just some of the battles that I saw her go through, I was just like, okay, I don't know what that's like, but let me just like at least speak to her or talk her through it or just, I'll, I'll just pretty much make sure that she knows that she's got someone there because like obviously it can be a, a little bit daunting being the only female in an all-male environment and these these guys are giants um oh my gosh 
Yeah. Like watching them squat hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And then I'm over there with like my 20, like my 15 pound dumbbells, like doing like, you know, things. And um, it, it's really funny to look back on. Uh, but, you know, I think to your point, the, the one area, the one thing I love about the strength and conditioning area from my experience is a lot of the men that are in that area are super supportive. Like they would never have looked at me and been like, oh, she doesn't know what she's doing. Um, it was nice enough for them to even invite me to lift with them, like while the guys were out to practice. So, um, but to your point, I think it's really important that obviously you reaching out and making sure like she felt comfortable and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah. What's, what's some of the things that the coaches that that kind of made you feel like more at ease and more comfortable? Um, I think maybe it was just the way that they, you know, explained certain things to me or showed me different things. It was never, if they were critiquing me on like form or anything, it was never, you know, you're doing it wrong. It was like, Hey, like this, you know, would probably help your progress. And they would give me um, just certain ways to, or different ways to think about certain exercises and stuff. And I remember one of the coaches saying, like, you know, hold this for longer and do this. And like the day that he was, you know, giving me different tips on what to do, I remember like walking out and my arms were, were like jello because I never thought to like do some of the things that he was telling me to do. Um, so I think that was the best part. Like they were just super supportive and really helpful. And they always came across as wanting to help and, you know, not like, you know, shaming me or making me feel embarrassed if I was like doing something wrong. So. Yeah, so for some of the guys that might be listening, what's some like a piece of advice that you can give them to sort of approach a female in the gym and sort of try and help them out with that way? Because it, it can obviously, especially in today's social media, like everyone's recording <laughs> everything, and men yeah. kind of feel intimidated, like even just speaking to a female in the gym because they don't want to be known as that gym creep. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's some advice that you could sort of give men to on how to approach a female and just help them with the technique or just a certain movement that they could be doing better or yeah i would i think the best approach would be to be obviously very positive um and very like i said not like she's doing it wrong but like hey you know if you came over if somebody came over to me and was like hey you know i noticed that um you know you were kind of doing this and like this might be super helpful if you kind of you know use this form or like I found for me, like, this is the best way to to do this exercise or, um, you know, and a lot of things, you know, for me personally, too, just because now I have so much experience in the gym, if I see somebody doing something wrong where I feel like they're going to injure themselves, it's really coming from, like, a place of, hey, like, I care about you. I don't want you to get hurt. Um, I want to help you. So I think if they just, like, approach it from, like, a very positive lens and just be like, hey, like, you know, just wanted to to let you know. And um, obviously, if they, they want or you know help with any kind of form just be like is it okay if I show you this is it okay if I spot you here like first kind of you know getting like a, a verbal consent or at least like making them feel okay and comfortable but um I would absolutely love if I was doing something wrong at the gym for a guy to come up and be like hey like you know this is the better form to do or um just I just want to make sure you're not going to injure yourself and this is like the better way to do it so yeah but do you make sure if you are spawning someone or doing someone um, technique work that you do know the proper technique for it just don't stop right. people uh, not you I'm just speaking very widely because I know a lot of people think that they've got the best technique because they watch it on TikTok and then because mm-hmm. I've had that as well I've had someone come out to me and was like oh that's not how you squat I was like okay that's fine yeah um I'm, I'm okay um so yeah. please do make sure you're coming back a with a good intention to come forward and speak to them but you also know if if they're doing it right or wrong for a specific reason because i know like a lot of squats you may not have the mobility or range to keep your feet in line so you might have to go right. a little bit wider but that again can look wrong or weird to some people but that's just people are individual <laughs> yeah 100 percent perfect um thank you so much for your time do you want to plug your website and all your resources yeah so um everybody can find me right now uh i mostly post on on tiktok Uh, you can find me at anna trims and then on instagram also at anna trims um instagram is more where i do like my messaging and dming obviously because it's hard to talk on tiktok when uh, comments are limited to a certain character amount so 
um, TikTok and Instagram are probably the, the best ways to get in touch with me. Um, and also I'll just be, be sharing content on there. And um, I do have some things that I am working on right now that I, I want to be sharing in the, the upcoming week. So um, I would just direct everybody to um, my, my Instagram and TikTok. And I do have you have my, my links pulled up here. Um, I have, you know, a cycle syncing calendar link here that people can, you know, view and download for free. Um, I have, uh, you know, my clean makeup. I'm, I'm very passionate about also like clean beauty and makeup ingredients too. That's like a whole, a whole different story for a whole nother time. But, <laughs> um, I have like clean makeup and clean products linked in, uh, both like my shop me and Amazon there as well. So, um, those are both the link in my bio and both my TikTok and Instagram. So. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. No, it's all good.